So this past week, I had a bunch of people asking me, what is it that you're going to be preaching on this week? And I kept my response short and sweet. So I just told them how it was. I'm preaching on adultery. <laughs> so you can imagine that the congregation would have just been filled that Sunday uh, because of preaching on this wildly popular topic of adultery. And the funny thing is, it actually was a pretty full Sunday when I preached on this. The problem that we have today is that adultery and sexual immorality is not only everywhere, but hey everybody, welcome to Pride Month. It's celebrated. If you watch TV shows or movies, you can hardly get through one episode or one movie without, le without at least one lewd comment or joke. And by the way, I'm including movies that were designed for kids. If you drive down the street, oftentimes you'll see billboards and stores with ads that are designed to stimulate your mind in that sort of way. And don't even get me started on the internet. You can be visiting the most innocent of web pages only to find sexualized advertisements, provocative news stories, or people on social media desperately trying to get attention by showing off their goods. Let us read what Jesus had to say. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Most translations that I read don't say cause you to stumble, but rather cause you to sin. I actually like that word in this context a little bit more. I recall a time when I was in college, and I believe I was a sophomore at Cleveland State University, and I developed lots of relationships with the homeless people in that area, in downtown Cleveland. Uh, and the way that these conversations always sort of started off was I was walking along, ran into a homeless person, started talking, and we just kind of walked and talked. And one of those relationships was with a gentleman who, as I approached him, was kind of catcalling toward women as they would pass by. Now, I don't remember exactly how our conversation got started, but as I approached him, we started talking and he began to walk with me and we just continued our conversation. The funny thing is, he, start, he started to share with me how he was a Christian and how he went to church and how he loved the Lord. And then there was a pause because he happened to see an attractive woman walking toward us. And as she approached us, he turned his, I mean, as she started walking by us, he turned his head and then his whole body and he said something along of, Woo-wee! You fine! Okay, so, then he finished what he was saying about being a good Christian. And in fact, in fact, he was telling me that he had never committed a sin. Not one sin in his entire life. And I tried to be, I, I, I tried to be very, um, gracious toward him when I was questioning him on this. I said, so you, what, you never like, I don't know, stole anything? Nope, not one thing. I don't know, you never like told a lie? Nope, never told a lie, not in my entire life. And I said, uh, you know, the Bible says that if you look at a woman with sexual feelings, that you've committed a sin with her in your heart. He said, what? No way. Really? And I said, yeah, it says that. He said, where does it say that? I said, Jesus said that. And he said, no way. I said, yeah. It was a good day for him because he got to learn that he indeed, like the rest of us, were sinners. And so he got to repent of that sin. I've heard renowned philosopher Dennis Prager comment on this topic from a Jewish perspective. And by the way, I want you to know I respect Dennis Prager, and I think he does great work. Uh, but listen to his opinion on this topic. He said that he hosted a forum with several Bible scholars, one of which was an Orthodox Jew who was a 
an Old Testament scholar. And when asked about his thoughts on what the Bible says about lust, his response was, Lust schmust. The concept is never mentioned in the Old Testament. To sum it all up, he was saying that it is okay to look with lust upon another person, so long as you do not act on it. But was what he said true? Is Jesus unique in talking about this topic? Is Jesus in the New Testament unique in calling lust sin? Well, I think it is very important for us to clear this all up uh, before we move forward. We don't want to be left thinking that the Old Testament and the New Testament are different from one another. The God of an Old Testament and God of the New Testament, rather, we want to know that they are indeed the same God that never changes and the standards always the same. And unfortunately, it is not hard to find the concept of lust in the Old Testament. If you turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 20, we'll see the answer to this question. Now, some of you already realize that we are turning to the Ten Commandments. You might be thinking, yes, it says you should not commit adultery, but that's not really what Dennis Prager or this Jewish rabbi were saying, right? Well, that's correct. We're not talking about adultery. They weren't talking about adultery directly. We are addressing lust, except neither the words lust nor adultery are used in this verse I'm using to support Jesus' claim that sexual desires towards people other than your spouses are wrong. Exodus 20, 17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet what? Your neighbor's wife, or his male or female, ser his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Does anyone know the shorthand for this commandment? It's thou shalt not covet. The sin of lust is indeed the sin of covetousness. Do you see what Jesus was doing here? He was saying that, well, you might think you're out of the weeds because you've never engaged yourself with another man or with another woman. You probably feel pretty good about that. But in your heart... You are not grateful for the husband or the wife that God has given you. You are not grateful for the gift of singleness that God has given you. I am here to tell you that you are coveting after other people in your heart. And that's a sin. Covetousness. That's a big deal. And it used to be a hidden sin. Now it is a celebrated sin. Just like sexual sin is celebrated, covetousness is celebrated. We are immersed in it. You literally cannot watch a television program, internet show, go on a walk in the city, or visit the doctor and not be told that you should be wanting something that will make your life better. And am I guilty of covetous? Well, you better believe it. Are you guilty of covetousness? Absolutely. And if you didn't think so before, you probably kind of feel like that guy I was walking with in downtown Cleveland who all of a sudden it dawned on him that he was a sinner, that he had committed adultery in his heart through lust, which again we're calling covetousness. You should not covet is the 10th commandment. And I feel like it is a catch-all for anything that's not listed in the 10 commandments because covetousness covers lust as we have defined it, greed, selfishness, pride, envy, and jealousy. It is the sin that flies under the radar because we all want things, right? And I'm not saying that Jesus is saying that you are not allowed to want things. He was exposing a deeper spiritual reality, just as he did with murder. You think it's just murder? You think it's just adultery? The problem you are wrestling with is far worse and far more severe than an action you commit. You've got a heart problem. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. What James wrote, in James 4, 1 and 2, 
is profound. In fact, when we understand it properly and we understand what Jesus said, we can trace covetousness, this sin of lust, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Why did Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? <clears throat> Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. It all started with lust. How do we combat this? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus uses some pretty severe language in addressing the remedy to this issue. Now, he's not really telling people to gouge out their eyes and chop off their hands. What he is saying is that it is not worth it to allow something material, not your hand and not even your eye, to cause you to sin. If it were your eye causing you to sin, well, then you should gouge it out and throw it away. If it's your hand, cut it off. Throw it away. It's not worth it to allow something material to cause you to sin. Read Jesus' words. He says, It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. He means that. And it's true. No sin is worth it in exchange for eternal damnation. What I hope I've made clear, though, is that it is not your hand nor your eye that is causing you to sin. It is no more the culprit than to say the piano has played the song, or the paintbrush has painted the picture, or the gun has killed the man. Your hand is a part of your body. It is not your eye that sins. It is you, motivated by a sinful heart. It starts in the heart. One of the best ways to squelch the desire to do evil is through confession. Or maybe you've already crossed the line and committed evil. Once again, I prescribe confession. The more in the dark we keep these issues, the more our desires boil over like a pot of soup. And these desires will bubble over. They will get worse unless we handle them appropriately. And it is up to spouses, church leaders, and fellow church goers to extend forgiveness. It is better for someone to humiliate oneself and damage his or her reputation through confession than to be cast into the fires of hell. The beauty of Jesus' sermon and the gospel is that he addresses these issues so that you might be aware of your sin. We all need to know of our shortcomings, how we fall short of the glory of God. When we see the broken nature of our hearts, it is easy for us to approach Jesus and to say, Good physician, my heart's broken. I need healing. And can you, can you give me a new heart, a heart that you've made for me? Oh, yeah, he does. He sees our sickness. He gives us a new heart. And he himself becomes the source of power that we might live with him from here to eternity. I'd like to thank you for joining me for today's sermon. My name is Bill Sang from Faith Presbyterian Church. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 1030. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.